In a far-off sector of the multiverse where stars twinkled with a particularly sinister kind of menace, there lived a being known only as the Great One, the Keeper of Worlds, the supreme overlord of every noteworthy rock and speck of cosmic dust. And he had precisely one rule for his most loyal generals. No planet shall be withheld from my collection. Now, this was all well and good until General Skrelsuk, one of his most senior henchmen and possessor of Earth, took it upon himself to disregard this rule entirely. One day, as the Great One was updating his infinite catalog of cosmic conquests, an administrative nightmare even for a galactic despot, he noticed a rather glaring gap in the list. Earth, he muttered, where in the seven dimensions of Zorfion is Earth? The answer, as it turned out, was classified by General Skrelzuk himself. Naturally, the Great One summoned Skrelzuk at once to explain himself. The meeting took place in the Great One's intimidating office, which was furnished entirely with floating cubes of pure antimatter, partly because it looked ominous and partly because no one had dared tell him that antimatter cubes were terribly outdated. When Skrelzuk entered, he held his head high, as high as a head with six eyes can be held, which was actually not very high at all. The Great One fixed him with a gaze that could incinerate an asteroid belt. You have taken a planet, a rather lovely blue one. Skrelzuk shifted uncomfortably, as any six-eyed being would under such scrutiny. Yes, my supreme exaltedness. I, well, I hid it from you. Hid it, bellowed the Great One, the room dimming slightly with his rage. I don't need to remind you, Skrelzuk, that I am the Keeper of Worlds. There isn't a pebble in this universe that's meant to be outside my domain. Yes, well, you see, Skrelzuk's eyes all focused inward, attempting to avoid direct eye contact with his master. Earth, it has these, er, creatures. Creatures, the Great One's voice dripped with disdain. I know about its creatures, the humans, their small fuzzy mammals, the delicious crustaceans. Not those creatures, Skrelzuk muttered. The females. The Great One blinked all 14 of his eyelids in disbelief. Are you suggesting that you've kept an entire planet for its females? Well, yes, Skrelzuk admitted, rubbing his top two hands together nervously. They're rather fascinating. And this is your excuse for treason? The Great One stared at him incredulously, then sighed a sigh that could depress a black hole. Very well, Skrelzuk. I can't have you gallivanting across the galaxy with entire planets just because you've developed a soft spot for a species that's statistically guaranteed to die out in a few eons. However, I am nothing if not reasonable. Skrelzuk waited, feeling an odd glimmer of hope. I will forgive you, the Great One continued, if you bring me 500,000 planets to replace the one you denied me. Skrelzuk's six eyes bulged in unison. 500,000? That's... A lot of planets, sire. Yes, it is a lot of planets. Perhaps next time you'll think twice before withholding one from my infinite catalog of cosmic conquests, the Great One said, his mouth curling into something vaguely resembling a smile, if the sight of a neutron star collapsing could be considered a smile. But, Skrelzuk ventured timidly, what if, hypothetically, Earth were to accidentally fall back into your collection? You could just forget about the whole thing. The Great One raised a single, all-knowing eyebrow. No, Skrelzuk, you have made your choice. Now either fetch me those 500,000 planets, or I'll have to reassign your post to that rather overambitious blob of gaseous matter in Sector X-17. I hear it's quite keen on collecting human things like shoes and sugar packets. Skrelzuk sighed deeply. Very well, my greatness. I shall begin my quest at once. But he muttered to himself as he slunk from the room. No earthling female will ever compare to the thrill of a forbidden conquest. And with that, he departed on his planet-gathering mission, where he would collect, catalog, and obsessively negotiate with beings all across the galaxy to fulfill his quota. Meanwhile, he secretly kept tabs on his treasured Earth from afar, knowing that he could never truly relinquish it. After all, the humans were just too... interesting. In time, Skrelzuk would return with his planets, each one dusted, polished, and filed neatly in the infinite catalog. But he knew deep down that no planet, not even a nice one with rings and breathable air, could ever match the allure of Earth. The Great One, of course, knew this all along, 
But sometimes for an omnipotent ruler of worlds, it's just too entertaining to see his generals scramble for a sense of order in a universe that was, by nature, endlessly chaotic. General Skralsok had spent an uncomfortably long time among the Earthlings, slowly blending into their peculiar ways, watching them evolve and invent strange technologies like smartphones and social media. He had also found, to his growing dismay, that Earth's cherished natural wonders, the glowing coral reefs, the lush rainforests, and even the icy caps at the poles, were, over time, dwindling to barren wastelands under the Great One's insatiable drain on the planet's resources. Earth was looking less like the enchanting world he had first discovered, and more like one of the Great One's forgotten trophies, all used up, cast aside, and stripped of its life. Skralza couldn't help feeling a pang of guilt. Perhaps it was the stubborn sense of duty he'd inherited from his species, or maybe it was his newfound attachment to humans, specifically their knack for humor and ill-advised bravery. Either way, something had to be done. Late one evening, while Skralzuk sat in a quiet corner of a dingy diner, attempting to eat a hamburger in a way that wouldn't blow his cover, he made a decision. He was going to save Earth. But freeing an entire planet from the clutches of the Great One wasn't going to be easy. The Great One's empire had ways of keeping a planet under tight surveillance, and even worse, a disturbingly vast network of energy siphons and mineral extractors rigged beneath the surface. These devices were anchored so deeply in the Earth's crust they could pull resources from the mantle itself, like a galactic straw sucking up Earth's very lifeblood. Skralzuk pushed aside his hamburger, a fresh resolve forming in his many-eyed gaze. He would have to start small, weakening the extraction systems bit by bit without raising suspicion. Over the following months, General Skralzuk began an elaborate campaign to sabotage the Great One's operations on Earth. By day, he continued to play the part of an unassuming Earthling, blending into their chaotic lives. By night, he moved underground, literally disabling energy siphons, reprogramming mineral extractors, and diverting their devastating beams of cosmic suction to avoid the planet's core. To the Great One, of course, it looked as though Earth had simply become less productive. In time, rumors of Skralzuk's deeds spread through the galaxy whispered between rebel factions and asteroids in the outer sectors. He was now known as the general who fell for a planet. Some found his actions romantic, others thought him an absolute fool, but the Great One himself remained oblivious, for he was far too preoccupied with conquering the Hrolfak Cluster, a galaxy so difficult to pronounce that most beings didn't even try to conquer it. After a while, the extraction fields on Earth had weakened enough that plants began to grow back, fish returned to the seas, and, most astonishingly, humans started noticing that the world around them seemed less terrible. They called it environmental recovery and assumed it was the result of something they'd done. Skralzuk chuckled at that. Earthlings, bless them, always ready to take credit for what they didn't understand. But just when he thought he might have finally liberated Earth from the Great One's grip, a communique arrived in the dead of night. It was in his inbox under the unassuming subject line, Urgent, all seeing eyes on you. The Great One's voice boomed from the screen, filling the dim room with a dread Skralzuk hadn't felt in ages. Skralzuk, he began, each syllable dripping with imperial condescension. I know you've been a rather busy little general. Fancy yourself some sort of planetary savior now, do you? Skralzuk gulped but managed to steady himself. Great One, I... Enough! The Great One snapped, his voice sharper than the cutting edge of a black hole. Did you really think I wouldn't notice your little pet project? While you've been scurrying around like a cockroach, Earth's productivity has fallen to zero. Do you even know what that does to my conquest quotas? Skralza clenched his fists. He'd come too far to back down now. Your greatness, he said carefully. Earth is unique. It deserves better than to be drained and tossed aside like like so many of the planets you've discarded, it deserves a chance to thrive. The Great One leaned back, an expression of pure amusement creeping onto his otherwise unreadable face. You know what's truly amusing, Skrelzuk? Your sentimentality. I never imagined one of my generals could be so distracted by one pitiful little planet. Earth is not pitiful, Skrelzuk shot back, a fiery resolve blazing in his eyes. It's a beautiful, chaotic, brilliant world, 
and I won't let you destroy it. For a moment, there was silence. Then the Great One let out a thunderous laugh, the kind that can only come from someone who's been alive long enough to own a universe. Oh, Skralzuk, he chortled. You've gone soft, and now I suppose you'll be wanting a battle for this precious world of yours? Skralzuk squared his shoulders. If that's what it takes, then yes, I'll fight for Earth. The Great One's eyes glinted with a sinister delight. Very well, General, he purred. But remember this, in the history of my conquest, no one has ever defied me and won. I will relish tearing your planet and you apart. With that, the screen went dark and Skralzuk felt the weight of his decision settle onto his shoulders. He took a deep breath and looked around. Earth might not have grand battleships or galactic weaponry, but it did have a stubborn sense of survival and, more importantly, a creature known as humanity that Skralzuk had come to believe could do the impossible. Earthlings, he whispered to himself, it looks like you and I have a battle to fight. And rallying what allies he could in secret, he prepared to take on the Great One himself. It would be the ultimate battle, the likes of which the universe had never seen. One general, a defiant planet, and a ragtag team of humans versus the insatiable greed of a cosmic conqueror. Years passed on Earth, and Skralzuk continued his life in secrecy, raising a child hidden from both human and alien eyes. She was, by all appearances, a human girl, though her curious, piercing gaze held the wisdom of many worlds. Her name was Elara, and by the age of six, it became quite clear that she was no ordinary child. Her eyes gleamed with the light of stars yet unseen, and she could command the forces of nature with a thought. Trees grew stronger in her presence, rivers ran clearer, and the air felt charged with a strange, almost cosmic energy. Skralzuk, ever the cautious general, knew that the Great One could never learn of her existence. Alara was more than just a girl. She was a bridge between two worlds, with power drawn from both her human mother and her alien father. She grew up learning about her father's origins and the evil that held sway over countless galaxies. She also learned of her father's defiance, of his battle to protect Earth, and of the formidable enemy known as the Great One, who saw all things as mere possessions in his vast empire. But even in Skrelsuk's wildest dreams, he had never imagined how powerful Elara would become. By the time she reached adulthood, Elara could harness energies that made even her father wary. Her powers were ancient, primal, and seemingly endless but they were also connected to something far greater, the very heart of a neutron star. This was a mystery she had yet to fully understand, but one she sensed would be central to her destiny. As her powers grew, so did the whispers in the galactic shadows. The Great One had heard of the girl with cosmic abilities, a rumor he dismissed at first as the imaginative prattle of desperate rebels. But as sightings grew more frequent and the strange tales began to align, he realized with dawning horror that this girl, this hybrid, might be more of a threat than he had anticipated. One dark and stormy night, Ilara received an urgent message from her father. It was time. The Great One's forces had gathered on the outskirts of the Milky Way. A vast fleet of dreadnoughts, warships, and mechanical leviathans stretching as far as the eye could see. And at the center of this armada was the Great One himself, resplendent in his otherworldly armor, his eyes fixed on Earth with a hunger that had grown bitter and vengeful over the years. As the fleet descended upon Earth, Alara stood atop a cliff overlooking the vast ocean, watching the sky darken with alien ships. She felt her heart race, not with fear, but with purpose. She had always known this day would come, and now with the Great One looming above her, she felt the full weight of her powers ready to ignite. Skralzuk, standing beside her, gave her a solemn nod. This is your battle now, Elara. You are stronger than I ever was, stronger than he could ever imagine. The Great One, so certain of his superiority, had no idea what awaited him. As the ships closed in, Elara took a deep breath and reached inward, feeling the immense power that coursed through her veins. She closed her eyes and summoned it forth, calling to the energy that had been her birthright. 
Her body began to glow with a light that was blinding, her form shimmering and shifting until she seemed to be more energy than matter. The Great One's fleet slowed, hesitating as they saw the impossible power radiating from this single figure on Earth's surface. The Great One himself stared, unable to comprehend what he was seeing. In a single fluid motion, Alara extended her hands toward the sky, and the unimaginable happened. She harnessed the energy of a neutron star, a force so intense that it could incinerate entire planets, and channeled it directly at the Great One's fleet. The Great One's ships disintegrated in an instant, his mighty dreadnoughts torn apart by the fury of a cosmic blaze. The very fabric of space trembled as the beams of starlight surged forward, obliterating the Great One's forces in the blink of an eye. For the first time in his long and fearsome reign, the Great One felt true terror. He tried to speak, to command his forces to retreat, but before he could utter a single word, the full force of the neutron star's energy engulfed him. He was obliterated in a blaze of light, his essence reduced to nothingness, scattered like cosmic dust across the galaxy. And in that instant, peace was restored to the universe. As the light faded, Alara felt the weight of the cosmos lift from her shoulders. The sky cleared, the earth breathed a sigh of relief, and balance returned to the universe, as if the cosmic scales themselves had been waiting for this very moment. Skralzuk embraced his daughter, pride shining in his many eyes. You've done it, Ilara. You freed us all. Who would have thought? That sort of power was in you. Alara smiled, though her gaze remained on the stars. She knew that balance was a delicate thing, and that one day, the universe might tip again. But for now, the galaxy was at peace, and Earth was free to thrive without the looming shadow of conquest. And so, with the Great One vanquished, life resumed across the cosmos. The name Alara whispered in awe across countless worlds. She was the girl who had risen from a humble, hidden life on Earth to become a protector of the galaxy, a symbol of strength, of resilience, and of the unbreakable bond between a planet and its most unlikely champion.